Hello everyone, this is Jim Lucy, Editor-in-Chief for Electrical Wholesaling and Electrical Marketing with our June 1st update on the economic impact that the COVID-19 coronavirus is having on the electrical market. Today's podcast is sponsored by Champion Fiberglass. The company began producing epoxy fiberglass conduit and fittings in 1988, and a year later, the company developed the first conduit from epoxy resins that had flame resistance and low smoke characteristics, meeting the most stringent codes and specifications. In today's broadcast, we will explore the latest weekly economic indicators that you can use to get a sense of where the electrical economy is headed in the coming weeks and months. One of the many challenges that electrical distributors, manufacturers, and reps are facing in this crisis is finding timely economic data that can offer an early indicator of where the market may be headed and when and where any economic turn for the better may be occurring. Local economic data for your electrical contractor and industrial customers, value of new construction, and building permits often lag the market by at least four to six weeks, and many other economic reports published by the federal government only come out once a month. The editors of Electrical Wholesaling and Electrical Marketing believe we have found a solution. Over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'll be discussing the latest data from some key weekly economic indicators that you can watch to take the pulse of the electrical market. We'll be providing these updates every two weeks. These five weekly indicators are initial unemployment claims at the state level, rail freight car traffic, the Baker Hughes rig count, oil prices, and copper prices, along with some special data from time to time on the construction market and different reports and surveys from electrical wholesaling. Our thanks to Champion Fiberglass for sponsoring today's electrical economy for 2020. Let's look at the data now. The weekly unemployment data from the U.S. Department of Labor and the U.S. Bureau for Labor Statistics highlights the states with the most unemployment claims so far in the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis. This data is valuable to electrical distributors, manufacturers, and reps because it offers some empirical evidence of just how big an issue layoffs are now at the state level. On a more positive note, when these claims start declining and establish a trend in this direction, it will be a clue for you about when the economy in that state is starting to improve. The data for April's unemployment rate at the state level is in, and the numbers are draw dropping. The overall unemployment rate for the United States was 14.7% in April, and 21 states have an unemployment rate worse than that. Nevada had the highest unemployment rate in the nation at 29.8%. This extraordinarily high rate is due to the state's dependence on the casino, restaurant, hotel, and hospitality industries, which were crushed. As you can see in the map, some of the other states with some particularly large unemployment rates were Michigan at 23.8%, Hawaii at 23.5%, Rhode Island at 17.8%, Ohio at 17.4% in April, New Hampshire at 17.2%, and Indiana at 17.1%. While national unemployment claims dropped last week by over 266,000 to 1,914,958, Several states still register some large numbers, including New York at 192,193, Florida at 173,731, and Georgia at 164,350. While still extraordinarily high by historical standards, these were sizable declines over the previous week. Some other um, unemployment under watch are the claims for 1,000 people in the state's labor force. This allows you to compare large and small states by the same metric. States with some large numbers of claims per 1,000 workers in the labor force were Georgia at 33.7, Kentucky at 26.1, Alaska at 25.5, New York at 21.3, and Mississippi at 20.4. An interesting leading indicator for the overall U.S. economy is freight rail traffic because it's a measure of the amount of raw materials and finished goods being shipped by rail. The best source for this data is the American Association of Railroads, which publishes this data weekly. Let's take a look. As you can see in this slide, total freight car traffic was down 13% year over year through the week ending March 23rd. Many key categories were down much deeper than that, including motor vehicles and parts, which were down 37%, and coal, which was down 26%. According to AAR statistics, for this week year to date, total U.S. weekly rail traffic was down 12.8% to 428,715 carloads. AAR Senior Vice President John Gray was a bit more optimistic in, though, in his recent reports and said, of the 20 carload categories we track, 15 had modestly higher carloadings last week and the week before, led by motor vehicles and grain. Meanwhile, intermodal originations were higher last week than any in any of the past 11 weeks. 
While we can't yet say whether rail traffic and by extension the economy have turned a corner, these are all encouraging signs. As areas across the country begin to reopen over the next several weeks, perhaps we can start to see, start looking for that light at the end of what has become a rather long tunnel. This slide also provides some more detail on both year-over-year -year and year-to-day basis for some key freight categories. Total car loads serve the various types of freight, intermodal, intermodal units and containers being shipped by rail, and total traffic is the combination of total car loads and total intermodal units. If you track the oil market, you're probably familiar with the Baker Hughes rig count, which tracks the oil and gas rigs that are operating. The data is available on a weekly basis on the state, basin, and national basis. The rig count continues to decline. The number of total oil rigs operating is down 67% year over year, with 541 fewer rigs through May 29th than there were late May last year. As we have mentioned in past presentations, it's interesting to note how consolidated oil production is in the United States. The Permian Basin in West Texas and eastern New Mexico and the Eagle Ford Basin in Texas typically account for over 70% of all operating rigs in the United States. I find that pretty amazing. There's roughly another 10% in the Williston Basin in North Dakota. That means 80% in just three basins. When you look at this chart, you can see why the drop of 304 rigs over the past year in the Permian Basin has such a big impact on the overall numbers. This area also saw the biggest drop in the weekly numbers, with 14 fewer rigs operating in the third week, then in the third week of May. The natural gas market declined slightly since our last presentation and is now down 109 rigs in total from last year at this time. That's a 59% drop year over year. The Marcellus Shale Play in Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, and West Virginia saw the biggest annual decline, with 34 fewer rigs operating over that time period. The bulk of the gas rigs are in the Haynesville Shale Play in southwestern Arkansas, northwest Louisiana, and East Texas, and in the Marcellus Shale Play. This slide gives you an idea of the largest oil and gas deposit. It really gives you a sense of just how many of the large oil plays are in Texas and Oklahoma, and how big an area the Marcellus gas region covers. Oil prices have improved over the past two weeks since their historic drop in April, but they're still on at a price where anyone is making any money drilling. Most folks will say they like to see the price for West Texas Intermediate at about $60 a barrel, which is where they started this year. That's the range where everybody reportedly makes some money. Since their wild plunge in April, oil prices have climbed through the month of May to over $30 a barrel. While the progress is encouraging, prices are still just a little better than half of what they were back in January. To provide some historical perspective, and as we mentioned in our last presentation, oil prices lived in the $70 of 100 plus range in 2007 through 2008. The break-even point per barrel oil varies by basin. Companies operate much more efficiently than ever before and have driven the price for profitable operation down quite a bit. A 2018 post on oilprice.com said the Eagle Ford breaks even at around $48 to $61 a barrel, the Bakken in North Dakota at $53 to $56 a barrel, the Niobra at $63 a barrel, and the Midland and Permian Basin at about $37 per barrel. Everyone likes to call copper pricing Dr. Copper because it's a leading economic indicator for future economic activity since copper is used in so many industries. The construction industry is among the leading markets because of its use in wire and cable and copper plumbing pipe. Copper prices seem to stabilize the May in the $2.30 range and ended the month at $2.42. They took their biggest dip this year on March 18th, declining 16 cents from the day before. That's right when many of the shelter at home orders started to kick in. As you can see in this chart, the current range is still down quite a bit from where prices start out the year in January when they were at about $2.82. And they spent most of January in $2.50 per pound. We're still quite a bit below that. Some historic perspective on the copper market may be helpful. When copper prices dropped as low as $2.10 per pound in the recent market turmoil, they didn't stay at that level very long, and certainly not as long as in 2016, as you can see on this slide. Now let's take a look at one of the best leading indicators for the construction market, the Architecture Buildings Index, published monthly by the American Institute of Architects, or AIA. AIA surveys its architects on their buildings and inquiries each month. Because they are positioned at the design phase of the construction cycle, they might start working on a project at least six months before contractors in that market. I always look forward to reading the analysis of AIA's Architecture Buildings Index each month by AIA Chief Economist Kermit Baker. 
Here's what Baker had to say about AIA's April report. With the dramatic deceleration that we have seen in the economy since mid-March, it's not surprising that businesses and households are waiting for signs of stability before proceeding with new facilities. Once business and activity resumes, demand for design services should pick up fairly quickly. Unfortunately, the big drop in demand for design services will have lasting consequences for some firms. As you can see in the slide here, the ABI has dropped well below the growth line, 50 points. AI says that that 29.3 score is a new all-time low for the index. Any score below 50 indicates a decrease in billings. More than half of the responding firms to the survey reported a further decline in their firm's billings from March to April. Increase into new work also remained extremely low in April, though modestly fewer firms reported a decline in increase than in March. However, AI said that immediate prospects for new work remained bleak, as the value of new design contracts also remained extremely low. The Architecture Billings Index also provides some reasonable outlook. As you can see, the Northeast has the lowest reading at 23 points. The South and Midwest both registered around 31 points. The West was significantly higher, but still below the growth threshold at 38.1 points. This concludes today's presentation. Thanks to Champion Fiberglass for sponsoring today's The Electrical Economy. We'll be running these podcasts twice a month for the rest of the year. Today's Electrical Economy podcast focused primarily on the national level. If you happen to need local market data, check out Electrical Marketing at electricalmarketing.com. A $99 subscription provides a wealth of data that you can use for your sales forecasting. We provide electrical sales estimates at the metro, county, and state level. Electrical product sales estimates for 17 product categories and access to a construction product database and other economic data such as building press and gross metropolitan product at the local level. An annual subscription to electrical marketing only costs $99 per year at our special promotional rate. The subscriptions include access to all the market data described in the previous slide, as well as electrical marketing newsletter published twice each month. You can get that either mail or digital in a downloadable PDF format. Some of the data that you'll get in the electrical marketing newsletter includes the electrical price index, which many subscribers tell us is worth the cost of subscription alone. If you're interested in subscribing to electrical marketing, contact Sony Trent. You'll see our email on the screen here. Thanks for listening today. Contact me if there's any other type of economic data that you'd like me to be covering in these podcast presentations, which I'll be running twice a month for the rest of the year. And thanks again to the folks from Champion Fireblast for sponsoring this series.